Transformations are a powerful set of mechanics which allow player characters to explore the darker side of the D&D universe by playing monstrous characters. And they are the perfect set of mechanics to answer the question that GMs get constantly from players, such as, I want my next character to be a devil, or is it possible that my wizard could actually ascend to be a lich? Transformations also allow GMs to introduce long lasting consequences to encounters with creatures such as vampires and werewolves, where the player characters may fall victim to some sort of magical curse. Transformations are featured in the Grim Hollow Campaign Guide and the Grim Hollow Player's Guide. And in the last video where we spoke about transformations, I discussed my three favorite transformation and class combinations. Well, today I'm going to talk about another three of my favorite class and transformation combinations, which work so well together, not just mechanically, but also thematically. My name is Ben Byrne, and this is what you need to know about transformations in D&D 5e. Inner peace is so hard to find when you have a constant animal gnawing at the back of your mind. I've tried it all. Meditation, spirituality, prayer. And the only thing that works is my one true god, the bottle. The werewolf typifies why transformation mechanics are just so cool because when you think of a player character taking on a magical curse and transforming into a horrible monster chances are you're probably thinking of a lycanthrope fighters paladins and monks not monks because i want to talk about monks fighters barbarians and paladins all make for mechanically strong lycanthropes that can get into combat and tear apart their foes in melee but there is one class that i think works so well with the lycanthrope transformation because it typifies the thematic element of balancing your bestial monstrous side with inner peace and that is of course pairing the lycanthrope with the monk the centerpiece boon of the lycanthrope transformation is of course your hybrid form your ability to transform yourself into a half sentient beast wolf bear turtle like creature it doesn't actually specify so you can kind of choose it for yourself and one of the greatest benefits of this hybrid form is the fact that you get access to unarmed strikes which being a monk you'll be able to use your dexterity instead of your strength for all of these unarmed attacks. At the early monk levels you can upgrade your unarmed strike from a d4 to a d6 quickly and even at the higher levels you have access to a bite unarmed strike attack which is a d8. Other great lycanthrope boons that the monk can make use of is the fact that you can become resistant to slashing, piercing and bludgeoning damage except for silvered or magic weapons. You can double your HP, or you can choose to get the ability to leap on your opponents and potentially knock them prone and grapple them instantly. And at the highest levels of your transformation, when your lycanthropy becomes its strongest, you can get a D12 for your unarmed strikes, which is higher than the monk can get naturally. But how does your monk deal with the fact that they have an inner beast which is trying to get out? Is it through monk-like meditation and spiritual does your monk work in the shadows and embrace their monstrousness, helping them in what it is they're trying to do? Or does meditation and spirituality not really work for your monk and perhaps you're a drunken master who tries to drown the beast in grog instead? In any case, your main transformation flaw for being a lycanthrope revolves around this idea that you might lose control of yourself during combat and start attacking anyone and everyone, prioritizing people who can't defend defend themselves. Overcoming this boon relies on a wisdom saving throw, which should be easy for you as a monk, right? I swear on the morning dew, in the dappled sunlight through the tree branches, that as long as the queen's wisdom guides my hand, no evil shall befall these lands. 
Not every transformation needs to be horrific and monstrous, and in fact, a character may find that change is upon them like the seasons, a gift granted for loyalty and service. A paladin bound by oaths to the summer or winter courts may find themselves soon counted among the Fae. Or perhaps they started life as a changeling, kidnapped from their mortal parents with a Wexelkin left in their place. And now they have grown up to become a champion and defender of the Feywild. There are many mechanical synergies for a paladin which is transforming into a fae, not least of which is the fact that your boon save DC, your transformation save DC, is based on your charisma score, which is going to already be your spell save DC. Your prerequisite is to have a charisma of 13, which shouldn't be a problem for a paladin. And as you level up, as you become more fae-like, early boons grant you a misty step-like ability, which allows you to get close into melee combat with the Faithless. And as you become a more powerful Fae creature, you can become more and more resistant to taking damage, which is really powerful for an already heavily armored Paladin. It is in the flaws of the Fae transformation, of course, that the roleplay opportunities bring themselves forward. As you become more and more Fae-like, you will need to swear loyalty to either the summer or the winter courts. And this means that twice per year on the summer and winter solstice, you must bring a gift to your fairy queen as a show of fealty. Failing to do so can have terrible consequences, but these gifts can be as significant as a kidnapped changeling or as insignificant as a secret that has been kept between two people. Finding these treasures and delivering them to the Fae Queen can make for amazing side quests or possibly even main quests if your GM wants to run a Fae themed D&D campaign. As you become more Fae-like, you will also be bound by your words, which means that anything that you say, any promises or pacts that you make, you must complete. You are bound by your words. This shouldn't be uncommon territory for an oath-taking paladin anyway. Being a capricious Fae-like creature, you're only bound to the literal words of what you've promised and not the spirit of how your words might have been intended. So which oaths should you take as a paladin who is transforming into a fae? Well, the Oath of Ancients is obviously perfect for capturing that green knight, antlered knight on the edge of the forest feel to your paladin. I love this oath's often overlooked tenets of cherishing the joy and life and warmth within the world. And you'll most likely be sworn to the summer court, which embodies warmth and joy and prosperity. Paladins with allegiance to the summer court will be as alluring and charming as they are dangerous. And other paladin oaths that may be sworn to the summer court include the oath of devotion or possibly the oath of glory. Conversely, a paladin which draws their power from the winter court is more likely to be fearsome and colder hearted. Oaths of vengeance, conquest, and even Grim Hollow's own oath of pestilence are likely to be held by a paladin who marches at the head of a spreading winter. Life was never kind to me, and it ended miserably. So if I'm going to be stuck for eternity in this personal purgatory, I may as well enjoy myself while I'm here. <laughs> as I discussed in our video, ugh. As I discussed in our video about making ghosts a formidable encounter for your player characters, ghosts scare me. There's no supernatural monster which gives me the heebie-jeebies quite like spirits and wraiths and ghosts. And nothing gives players the heebie-jeebies quite like their character perhaps meeting an early demise. Your player character has just died or had a brush with death and now they are transforming into a spectre. That might not be such bad news, especially if your player character happens to be a rogue. This combination of rogue and spectre is a mechanical match of just perfection. 
perfection. It uses your dexterity score to derive your transformation DC, which are obviously a rogue isn't going to have a problem with. And additionally, the early transformation boon to just simply walk through solid objects means that no vault or safe room is going to be safe from you ever again. As you slowly slip on into the afterlife, you're gonna have a damn good time in the meanwhile. Taking the arcane trickster archetype and moving things around with your invisible mage hand allows you to play a capricious poltergeist using other magical effects to both unnerve and terrify your enemies. The swashbuckler or thief archetypes also lend themselves perfectly to a mischievous spirit who is as charming as they are chilling and a character who may have some unfinished business they have to complete before they can pass on into the afterlife. Alternatively, you could take the assassin or the aptly named phantom roguish archetypes to play a deathly and terrifying wraith. The spectre transformation provides you with abilities to terrify and torment your foes, so much so that even your appearance becomes terrifying for them to behold. And your roguish abilities mean that you can get close to your enemies, finishing them off so that anybody who finds the corpses of your victims will only speak your name in whispered tones. And those are three more of my favorite class and transformation combinations. I know from the comments on the last video that I still haven't hit all of your favorites. So let me know if I've left one out in the comments below. I may do another one of these videos. And in the meantime, why don't you check out our last video on the transformation combinations with the classes, or you could look at the ghosts video where I talk about how to make ghosts formidable as combat encounters for your D&D players. They're here and here, and I will be back next week with another D&D Dark Fantasy video.